Hello, and welcome to lecture one of Magnetic Fields of Moving Charges in Phys 1204. In this video lecture, we're going to look qualitatively at the fields due to various arrangements of moving charges. I want to start by reminding you of a few things we saw in the previous unit and fill in one or two gaps with it. So we've seen that objects that produce magnetic fields, or we could say objects that are sources of magnetic fields, also feel magnetic forces. And this can be understood as a consequence of Newton's third law. If something is a source of magnetic fields, what that really means is that it exerts magnetic forces on other objects. And so Newton's third law tells us that those objects must exert magnetic forces back on it. So, for example, we know that a bar magnet is a source of magnetic fields, so you can understand this as perhaps that magnet 1 is producing a field, and that field exerts a force on magnet 2, but similarly magnet 2 produces a field, which is what is exerting a force on magnet 1. We've also seen that current carrying wires are sources of magnetic fields, and we've seen that current carrying wires feel magnetic forces. Don't get mixed up about these diagrams. In this first diagram, I'm showing you a magnetic field produced by this wire, but in this second diagram, I'm showing you a magnetic field produced by something else. We might call it an external magnetic field, and it is exerting a force on this wire. So, for example, we might have the bar magnet that we've seen producing a magnetic field, and that exerts a force on this wire. Well, that is the force, then, that the bar magnet is exerting on the wire, and Newton's third law tells us, therefore, that the wire exerts a force back on the bar magnet. We've also seen that charged particles that are moving feel magnetic forces. And so, for example, if a charged particle is moving past a wire, and we think about the magnetic field produced by the current in that wire, then there is a magnetic force exerted by the wire on the charged particle. And Newton's third law dictates that therefore, the moving charged particle must be exerting a magnetic force on the current carrying wire. And so we conclude that a moving charged particle must be a source of magnetic fields. We didn't see that in the last unit. This is new. I want to stress that it is only moving charged particles that are sources of magnetic fields. We've also seen that stationary charged particles do not produce magnetic fields, and they do not feel magnetic forces. They will interact with things like bar magnets, but only via familiar electrical forces. What's the shape of the magnetic field due to a moving particle? Well, we can think of it by thinking about a long wire, because the field due to a long wire must be a sum of fields due to moving particles, since that's what a current carrying long wire is, just a whole lot of moving particles all moving in a line. So that has cylindrical symmetry. It's symmetric for rotations about the wire and any mirror plane through the wire, and what's more, it has translational symmetry along the wire, if the wire is infinitely long. And so we expect the B field to form circles, we expect experimentally that it gets weaker as you get farther away from the wire, but you also expect it to be the same at any distance from the wire no matter where along the wire you look. Well, what about a moving particle? It doesn't have cylindrical symmetry, it has circular symmetry. That's almost the same thing. It's still symmetric for rotations about the axis that the velocity vector is pointing along and all mirror planes through that axis, what it lacks is the translational symmetry. And so we, ex we still expect the B field lines to be circles. However, we don't expect that it remains equally strong no matter how far we look along this axis. And so prior experience tells us it probably gets weaker as we move farther away from the particle, and so it might look like this. We're going to be looking at how to calculate the magnetic fields due to various arrangements of currents and moving charges, and so, for example, one of the things we'll look at is a long straight wire. But another thing we'll look at is a loop. 
So this is a current loop, and in practice you could actually build something roughly like this, although it would be difficult, but more commonly we have something like a coil, which can be approximated as a whole bunch of current loops stuck together. So let's think about what the field due to this must look like, and hopefully this drawing has given you an idea of perspective so that this bottom part down here is closer to you than this top part. And if you use the right hand rule, you can confirm that the field due to a little piece of the wire, say here, would be circles that would be around it with this sort of orientation so that they're coming up through the ring and down outside the ring. And so there would be a series of such circles like so. And similarly, if you were to look at another chunk of wire over here, and again do the right hand rule, you would find again that the field is coming up through the inside of the ring and down around the outside. And so let's now think about the field at a point on the symmetry axis of the ring. So here is the symmetry axis of the ring. And if we think about a point up here, what would the field look like here? Well, let me call this piece one and this piece two, and they're directly across from each other symmetrically. And the field up here, due to one, again using the right hand rule, you would find that it points vaguely something like this. And the field due to two would point something like this. And by symmetry, the horizontal components of those would cancel. And so we would get a total field that would be the sum of those two, which points straight up. And so up here, the B field is straight up. We can repeat that argument for every pair of points around the ring. Similarly, if we were to look at a point right in the middle of the ring, now the B field due to one is straight up, and the B field due to two is also straight up, and we're also closer to both wires, and so these B field vectors should really be bigger than the ones I drew up here, and so we would have a very large upward B field right in the middle of the ring. And similarly down below the ring, you would have a B field vector due to one, which would point roughly this way, and a B field vector due to two, which would point roughly this way. And again, we get a total B field straight up. Let's now look at a point outside the ring, say over here. Over here, the B field due to one is straight down. And the B field due to two is straight up, but must be rather small because we're a lot farther from piece two. And so the total B field over here must be down. Overall, the picture is that if you look down on the ring from above, and if this current is running from our perspective counterclockwise, then the B field must be coming out of the page everywhere we look in the plane of the ring and is rather strong. And above the ring and below the ring, it would also be coming out of the page. But outside the ring, the B field is down into the page and it must be rather weak out here. Let's see that with a real coil. So you can see here the current comes out of the source here in at this point, and you can see this yellow wire comes this way, and so the current is running counterclockwise in this coil. And now the, mag the, the compass shows you that the field is out, which you can confirm with the right-hand rule just like we did. And if I flip the coil around, now 
Now the current is going clockwise from our point of view, and you can see that the compass was showing the field points in. Here's my attempt to draw a three-dimensional perspective picture of a field due to a current loop, and you might notice something striking about it. It's really very similar in appearance to the magnetic field due to a bar magnet. And so this sort of shows us a relationship between current loops and bar magnets, and how you can think of them in the same way. You can think of it as if a current loop has a north magnetic pole and a south magnetic pole. It really doesn't, but it has the same sort of field configuration as an object that does have those poles. Something else you can think about as a way of thinking of what a current loop is like is that it's just like you have a charged ring that is spinning and that gives us a way of thinking about elementary magnets if you think about a spinning ring of charge and look at what happens to its field as you let its radius go to zero you end up coming up with exactly the dipole field due to an elementary magnet so this raises a question. Are electrons and other elementary particles like quarks just tiny spinning charged rings? Well, in fact, if you work through the theory, you come to the conclusion that they can't be for a variety of reasons, mostly to do with that they would have to spin way too fast. So the other thing to realize is that if you take a bar magnet and let all its dimensions go to zero, you also get a dipole field just like an elementary magnet. And so you can think of an elementary magnet also as just like a bar magnet. However, this term spin has stuck around because for a while people really did think that elementary particles were spinning and that's what produced their magnetic fields. And so you've probably heard of the spin of an electron. These days we generally talk more in terms of a moment. So we saw earlier in the course the electric dipole moment, and we haven't really done much with it, it's really beyond the course, and similarly there is something we call the magnetic dipole moment, which is beyond what we'll do in the course, but I'll just mention it briefly. You can calculate the magnetic dipole moment due to a bar magnet, or due to a spinning ring of charge, and similarly, elementary particles like electrons have magnetic dipole moments, and in fact, they've been measured to very, very high precision. And this is related to the quantum mechanical property spin that you will have encountered. So spin of particles like electrons is telling you something about their magnetic dipole moments. The one remaining thing that I will say about dipole moments is that anything with a dipole moment, whether it's a permanent magnet, or a coil, or an elementary particle, will tend to align with any magnetic field that it's in. So here is a coil, right now there's no current running in it, and I've suspended it from strings so that it's fairly free to rotate, but isn't free to move. And if I then turn on the current in it, you will see that with the current on, it aligns with the magnetic field, just like a compass needle would. And when I then turn off the, f the current in it, it stops aligning. So this is showing how anything with a dipole moment tends to align with the field, so that the dipole moment points in the same direction as the field that the object is in.